Hello, my name is Afsane Beshlas, and I wanted to welcome everyone to this great session we have with the most remarkable women on the board of Rock Creek. We have been very fortunate to have Laura Tyson, Dame Diane Julius, Jessica Einhorn, and Caroline Atkinson on our board for many, many years and benefiting incredibly from their wisdom, advice, and experience. I just thought given everything that is going on this month with Women's History Month, it would be really great to hear from them some of their stories. And one question I thought would be really interesting given how the world of economics, policy, finance, climate, technology, all the things that we all are involved in um, still continue to be very um, void, uh, devoid of women, and there are not too many women um, who are in these sectors, uh, it would be great to uh, hear from you uh, all about um, your journey being a woman and how that shaped your journey personally or professionally. Uh, Diane, maybe we will start with you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Afsani. Uh, and it's great to be here and great to be here with, uh, with so many women friends of mine. Uh, I, guess, uh, I guess I'd have to say my early training was uh, heavily in terms of how to be a minority because I have three brothers. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I think perhaps that um, uh, awakened quite a competitive instinct in me from a young age. Uh, but I also had very supportive parents, uh, and uh, I guess I'd have to say my father was more of a role model for me than my mother was, uh, who was a very competent housewife. Um, but perhaps that's why I never uh, felt particularly uncomfortable being in a, in a small minority as a, as a woman, professionally speaking. Uh, I guess it, uh, it sort of led me into areas that I thought were, uh, were fun and interesting, which happened to be mathematics and later economics. Um, but that naturally meant that I was often the, the only woman or the only girl, in fact, uh, in high school, instead of doing home economics, um, I did architectural drafting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't, That's the difference. Didn't add too much to my career <laughs> later, but I enjoyed it. Um, so, I suppose then later uh, at, uh, at the Bank of England, for example, I was the only woman on the Monetary Policy Committee. And, uh, and I guess when I joined later yet, you know, another decade hence, um, when I joined the board of BP, uh, the oil company, I was the only woman at that time on, on that board. But professionally speaking, I'd have to say, I felt being a woman, at least in those days, was more of an advantage than a disadvantage. Um, or at least that's how I perceived it at the time, because you certainly got noticed, you know, you, you were the odd, the odd person out, as it were. Uh, you got listened to, maybe only because they were so curious as to what this strange animal thought about something. Um, but professionally, I, I didn't find it a, a particular strain. And I guess I'd say personally, of course, that, that's more difficult, because I think, like most women, uh, particularly if you have children, there is this competing pull of, of loyalties. Um, and so that I think means that most of us have, have moments of regret that you never quite get over. Uh, I mean, for example, and this is a silly moment, silly thing to regret it so long ago now, but when my first grandchild was born, uh, my daughter tried to call me, of course, from the hospital as soon as the birth took place. But I was in Istanbul uh, on a World Bank mission and uh, I was asleep given the time differences. And in those days, um, you know, I'd left a message as I always do to wake me at a certain hour in the morning. Um, but of course that was the middle of the night. So small things like that, I think yeah. leave, a, leave a certain wound. And I guess I would just say uh, it, it's critical if you do uh, have children in particular, it's critical, at least I found to have a supportive husband and so uh, I'd, I'd uh, suggest to those young women, if you're out uh, looking for your partner, make sure that somebody who's <laughs> an equal opportunity household, both in terms of equal career importance, but also equal uh, parenting time. Caroline, I'd love to hear from you about this topic also. So that is an excellent point. And 
I was when I was thinking about this issue, as we've all been thinking, I guess, during this month, I had I came back again and again to the fact that my partner has, and we've been together for 40 years, and he is uh, has been a career person himself, but he is also someone who actually does most of the shopping. Uh, I think we kind of split emptying the dishwasher. He's great with kids and always has been. And I used to notice that when we would go away with other couples, sometimes to the beach when our children were small. And both Jeff and I would be involved in the conversations about policy and economics and global affairs. But both of us would also be keeping an eye on the children, making sure no one was drowning or, or that they were fine. Whereas the other couples, that there was more of a traditional gender divide. And certainly Jeff's support really helped me to be able to, uh, you know, to work and have children. And I must say that if I think about what difference has been being a woman made uh, to my life, I mean, obviously that is who I am. When I was younger, I was not really uh, aware of it being a particular problem. I saw it more as a challenge in the workplace. I was uh, started off being at Oxford University, which in those days was uh, eight men for every one woman. So I and a group of girlfriends were very proud of the notion that we were strong, smart women, and we were gonna make it in this world. And I've worked obviously uh, uh, in, in a world of finance and policy and tech, and they're all dominated by men. And that was not uh, a problem until I became older and more senior. And I realized that actually when you're a successful, when you're trying to be a successful woman, as you begin to compete more with your peers, rather than being a sort of promising young person, uh, it gets harder. And there's no question of that. And inevitably, I looked to other women to uh, guide me in, I worked in the International Monetary Fund, certainly a very male dominated place then. Uh, things have changed, there is now the second woman who is leading that institution. And I think that having senior role models is important and also having uh, peers who, uh, you know, who respect your opinions and who are willing to grant you space. Laura, it would be great to hear from you. I do actually think in my generation, uh, it was an advantage to be a woman, partly because it was the beginning of a period of time when people were paying attention to that, when they wanted to uh, recruit women, when they wanted to, uh, so I will take uh, MIT as an example here. First of all, I, I went to a woman's college and, and uh, thinking about the question, what affected me as a woman? One is at the time I went to college, none of the, uh, Ivy League men's colleges were open to women. It was only a few years later, they became open to women, but they were not open to women when I uh, went to college. So I went to Smith College. I went to Smith College and I um, did economics. I had been good at math as uh, Dion was. I had a nun, a nun who actually did not uh, pay. She was totally indifferent as to whether it was a girl or boy. I was the best math student she'd ever had. So she was with me, <laughs> um, but Going to Smith, here's one of the amazing things. I did not know that economics was a male discipline. It was the second or third most popular undergraduate major at Smith College. <laughs> and the faculty, mostly male faculty, but a few female faculty were completely supportive. They were great faculty members, completely supportive of building a serious undergraduate major in economics. So that was really important, okay? Not realizing that it was just, it was something I liked. I liked, I was good at it. Who knew it was a male discipline? When I decided to go to graduate school with the really, with the pressure 
the advice, the, the enthusiasm of my professors at Smith, who said, you must do this. You are really good at this discipline, go. Uh, it was when I got to MIT that I realized it was primarily a male discipline. <laughs> um, but here is what I wanna say about the advantage of the time. By the way, Laura, how many women in your economics, in the program? In so the there were 30, 30, first 30 students at the beginning of 30 students started. Uh, there were three women, uh, two of us finished, one dropped out. Right. That's so interesting because yeah. at Oxford, there were two women. I was one of two. Okay. And so, the woman happened to be the daughter of a famous economist. So. Oh, is that right? <laughs> so exactly um, the same thing. But I will say MIT from the beginning, MIT was, they were so enthusiastic about having me join them. And all of my concerns about whenever I would falter and think, God, these people, they're better mathematicians than I, they're more aggressive, they're more competitive than I, I can't do these kinds of problem sets. The, the faculty mentors, again, mostly men, we're highly supportive. Yes, you can do this. We can help you do this. You need to do this. You are really good at this, okay? So, um, and then I would say the advantage continued. I mean, uh, MIT, uh, Princeton, Princeton was looking for someone in my field. My field was comparative political economy. Uh, they were looking exactly in that area, but boy, it was a huge plus for them that a woman from MIT fit that bill. Okay, it wasn't that they recruited me because of that, but it was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. We are really, so, and I would say that generationally, given my age, that has been true a number of times. The commitment of government, the Council of Economic Advisors, the commitment of boards, the commitment of advisory boards to try to diversify and include women has been actually an important factor in my professional life. Absolutely the case. Um, I want to say uh, that in thinking about the, Dion mentioned the personal uh, trade-offs. So yes, I would completely, I always say, Dion, that uh, I think about the high power jobs I have had as family jobs. My, my family holds them as well as I hold them, okay? It has an effect on them. If I am sitting 24 seven working in the White House, they are being affected by my being there 24 seven. So it's their job, it's our job. And I will say that in that balancing act, for example, at the end of four years with the Clinton administration, I decided to return to academia. I had the opportunity to stay, I had the opportunity for a cabinet level position, another one because President Clinton had made the CEA cabinet level, but I said to him, I can't do it. I, I'm going back to a professional life, which is an academic life, which allows for more balance. And um, I know a number of my colleagues who, who made similar choices at the time, including some men, including uh, Secretary Bob Rice, who I was, uh, I, I remain close friends with today. So the balancing is huge. The supportive spouse is huge. Uh, oh, let me give you one other point of advantage. I went to graduate school when Gloria Steinem was starting Ms. Magazine, and there was an explosion of women's liberation. And, and the important point about that was the message that you should be confident, you should be confident. There's a whole bunch of psychological literature which shows that men in general tend to be overconfident and women in general tend to be underconfident. And what that, that has all kinds of implications. Underconfidence means you're more likely to say, ah, I can't do this, so I think I'll say no. I think I'll say no to this opportunity because I'll fail at the opportunity, okay? Uh, that's an example of mm -hmm. underconfidence. Um, so it was a moment in time when the message of women's liberation was you can succeed. And by the way, you must succeed because otherwise you'll let the entire women's movement down. I sort of felt like I was carrying a little bit of the responsibility of Gloria Steinem on my shoulders. Uh-oh, uh I can't quit this. This is a moment in time when women are breaking into economics. Let me do that. <laughs> I think a lot of women have the notion that they really need to, uh, and the research has shown this, they really need to be perfect. They're only going to apply for a job that has 10 
characteristics if they already meet nine of them and maybe all 10, whereas the guy will feel more confident about thinking, well, it's a stretch, but I only meet three of those criteria, but I think I could meet the rest. And it's important for younger women to have confidence in themselves. And that includes sometimes things not working out or you get rejected and you need to bounce back. I think another thing that's really important is for women to be engaged, not just in the immediate task that they have at hand, but in the broader surrounding and network. That's happening more and more now, I feel. I notice on, um, well, even on Twitter, on Econ Twitter, which is you know, a group of economists that talk about policy on, on Twitter and in other places, uh, younger women, I think, are a little bit more willing to, um, to have their voices heard. But that is very important. I used to say to people at, at the IMF when, when I was a senior manager to the women, come to the meeting and then sit at the table. Don't sit at the back and think, well, I can always dash out if I need to finish something quickly. Just you know, be there, be confident of your place and uh, behave as if you ought to be there because you probably should be there. It's interesting because as we speak, um... A lot of women are coming out of the workforce, right? I think that, you know, as we yes. in, the statistic, in Japan, a million in the US, a lot of women in emerging mm -hmm. markets, it could be, you know, a, as much as 10%. Yes. Um, and these are women who may not easily find jobs to go back. So I think yes. your message of, um, you know, having that confidence, even if you lose your job or you choose to come out of it, you choose um, to come out of it. If you, you come back, and uh, no matter what your profession is, um, is, so, so important. Well, I think uh, the other thing I want to say, and it's true for Dion and it's true for me and true for you too, is it, it really is important in entering the workforce to think about the skills that you need to make the case for your, your confidence has to rest on your sense, your ability, and that has to rest on your skills. And it seems to me that it is important, even in thinking about these skill transitions. If women have left, a lot of them have left because their jobs have disappeared and because their care responsibilities at home, they've borne the brunt of the, of the, of the increase in care responsibilities at home. No school, you gotta be home. Right. One of the things I should mention, because Diane was a role model in so many different ways, but Diane, you may not remember this. Uh, you lived on Logan's Circle and you had, um, at the moment, I think you had, your kids were really young. And I remember you were very strict. You would jump on your bicycle and ride home at around six-ish. We had a French director who was very uh, always um, interested in starting meetings around 5.30, quarter to six, and then going on until 8 p.m. or whatever. And Diane was very disciplined and, you know, sort of big woman who was one of the biggest stars at the World Bank at the time, but she would get on her bicycle and, um, and get home to be, you mm. know, home at a certain time. Of course, she, was, she worked harder than anybody else all through the evening and the weekend and, you know, all through the other days, she was also her productivity and efficiency was higher than everybody else's. But, you know, when you talk about the thing, and I always felt I never did that, you know, you were so disciplined. So you can look about the things, think about the things you didn't do, but also look yeah. at the things that you did. And I think at that time, that was, very, I always thought you were very brave to do that. Mm. Um, to, yeah. Well, I think it, uh, it definitely was a, a, a conscious choice. I just decided, you know, I needed to be home, have dinner with the kids, uh, and then they'd go to bed early. Uh, I was also very disciplined about that. You know, by eight o'clock, they were in bed. <laughs> <laughs> and because then I needed to go back to work. I mean, not physically to go back, but to yeah. finish reading the papers or whatever. So but Sonny, I must tell you that our boss, Yves Ravani, uh, the, the Frenchman who you're absolutely right, had no sense of time at all. Um, he came to visit me here, here in London, uh, oh, maybe 10 years ago now. Um, and he, he uh, reminded me of that. I'd completely forgotten about it. But he said, yes, you, you disciplined me as to when I needed to finish and let people get home. Yeah. So, uh, 
because he had to become a little bit more disciplined. After you left, he would keep it a little shorter, but that is true. Um, but can I, can, I, can I say something in response to this? Because a couple of things. Number one is uh, there are also, uh, Dion's example uh, is an example of women have a tremendous, uh, been tested many times, capacity to multitask be be because, because it's still the case that even with a supportive spouse, uh, a very supportive spouse, oftentimes a disproportionate share of the care and household responsibilities continue to fall on women. So you have to figure this out uh, and women are very good at it. The, the second thing I, I want to say is that in ours, you mentioned, Dion, you just decided to go home. This is this has been a problem because high intensity workplaces where promotions depend upon just being around as many hours as you can be and being on call. You know, somebody calls you on a Sunday and says there's a legal case you have to do this now or you have to work on this IPO right now. Those jobs don't have a lot of time flexibility in them. Um, I remember in the case of the White House, I, and I'll just think it, it cost me something in the White House. I would leave at 6.30 at night to get home in time for dinner. Many of my male colleagues never left or maybe left by 2 a.m. or maybe left at 4 a.m. And, and I would come in in the morning and things would have moved without me because I wasn't there. And what I want to say is that many, many, Many companies now, uh, with the pressure of their employees, are actually have tried very hard to make more family friendly work schedules so that there isn't the expectation that you are there morning, noon, and night, and you'll sacrifice everything so that you can be there morning, noon, and night. The, comp the rules of the competition have gotten somewhat better, I think, because as there are more women, competing for these places, people realize it's just not appropriate to require people to be 24 seven. And I mean, 24 seven, okay? I mean, 20, to succeed. So I think that's, a, I think that's a, a good thing. I think that's been happening and I, I'm, right. I'm happy about that. I will say there's another very important thing that uh, one of the, my original group of uh, Oxford friends, and by the way, we're still in contact with each other. We've been doing quite regular Zooms during this strange COVID year, half a dozen of us uh, from around the world. Uh, one of the things that one of my closest friends said to me when I was pregnant with my first child was, and I was worrying about work and going back to work and so on. And she said, that's a conflict. I mean, you're never gonna fix it. There just will be a conflict between work and mothering and childcare. And that I found really helpful. You could think it's depressing, but it was helpful because it just set expectations. And Jeff, my partner, used to laugh that uh, when we were going to work, especially when our children were pretty small and we lived close to uh, downtown in Washington and would cycle to work. And he would say that as I passed K Street, which is about halfway to the office, he felt that my brain was switching out of, you know, did I arrange the, did I talk properly to the nanny? Have I arranged this after school uh, issue? Is Grace or Lily okay to, is that report going to be done on time? Uh, do I need to do a lot of editing or correction? So my brain kind of switched from home focus to work focus. And I, I think that for me, having that segregation was actually quite important. But of course you miss out on things. Uh, I know Deanne mentioned about missing the, her, her grandchild being born. And one of the, th the things that, uh, that I remember in the opposite direction was that there was a big emerging market crisis when I was in the treasury department. And we had a debate about what the US reaction should be and my older daughter was, I promised I was going to go shopping for jeans with her. So I, I did that. Um, 
And, but I came in early the next morning. I mean, I did it in the evening, came in early the next morning. And suddenly the debate had ended in a completely different place from where I'd left it. And I felt frustrated because I actually didn't agree with where we ended up. But I'd missed uh, what turned out to be a couple of crucial hours of debate and discussion. But, you know, the world goes on and it's just hard. And Jessica, I would love to hear from you also on this topic. The world has changed a great deal. And for the young people who are coming in today, I think it's more welcoming uh, than mine. I started almost 50 years ago and the women today need less advice, I think. One thing is, if you're, you have many roles as a woman, you have a homemaker, you have a mother, you have a wife, uh, and then you have a committed professional. I think one of the things that I found most useful was to take a deep breath and realize that you could not be in two places at once. If you're at work and you need to be at work, try not to think and pull yourself to where you have to be, because if you can't be there, you won't be. So making the correct choice for yourself different situations will come to different choices. Choose where you need to be and then be there without tearing yourself apart about where you might also be. Um, I think that brings peace of mind. Um, and I think, uh, as I said, parents matter. So those are my uh, few ideas and uh, I hope they come in useful, usefully to others. By the way, our friend uh, Caroline Atkinson talking about the bicycle, she has continued to do that. I don't know if, you know, I never, I go bicycling. But I don't <laughs> Take know, it to bicycle. <laughs> and she's continued to bicycle to work when she works at the White House, when she worked uh -huh. at the IMF, uh, when she goes to wherever she's going, except. Uh, yeah, so, so she has continued on that. So uh, uh -huh. you get your exercise and you get home. On time. And you get to work and you get that's to work. Right, that's yeah. right. Maybe there is a, there is a message there for, uh, for all women. Um, I just wanted to sort of shift, um, you know, we've talked about this before. Um, all of us have had great mentors. I've had the fortune of working with both of you at very important times in my career where you've, you, uh, you all have actually advised me at different points in time. And have been really, really generous with that. But um, you've been generous with many others, whether it is through your academic work, whether it is through your, um, you know, work on boards. I think you, you know, all of you have been on boards from BlackRock to um, Morgan Stanley, uh, to CBRE, to Roche, to BP. I, I mean, I can go on and on uh, with the lists. But um, but in terms of the um, area that I wanted to sort of um, ask you is if you look at the next generation uh, of women starting their careers, um, what do you know now that you would suggest to them on this topic? And, um, and Laura, by the way, I'm just trying to think aloud. I think, uh, were you a mentor to Janet Yellen or is it vice versa? Or you both have been mentors <laughs> to each other? I know you go back a long way. I think I, we go back a long way. We go back to, I was in charge of the personnel committee in the econ department at Berkeley when we brought Janet and George to the Berkeley campus. I was very important part of making sure those things worked out. Uh, I was the Council of Economic Advisors when we recruited Janet to join the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. She was our candidate. I mean, and and and, then, and we've been colleagues at Berkeley. For, uh, recently, we just spent a lot of time together with in the state of California before she went off to Treasury. So I would say not mentors, just I, I have been involved in her, with her professionally uh, many, many times. Um, I will say, this is a, implicit in your statement. I, I think women recommend women. I remember I got a call about, uh, was I interested in being the chair of the, the CEO and chair of the San Francisco Fed? And I was on my way out uh, to go to London. And I said, no, but I got the perfect person for you. It's Janet Yellen, just, just choose her. <laughs> no, you don't even have to do a search, stop. Um, so I, I think women 
do they know other accomplished women and they recommend them? And I think that's really an important thing for all of us to do whenever we can. I mean, I, 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 I'm doing it, you know, regularly for the administration. I do it for boards. Um, so that's the way I would answer that question. Um, Diane, how about you? Yeah, I, I would, uh, it's interesting to hear that from Laura because uh, like you, I think once one gets on these lists of headhunters as somebody whose name comes up, um, you call, you do get called about things which probably you have no time or in some cases interest in. Right. Um, I, I keep a little list actually, uh, not on my computer, but you know, an actual physical list that I can ah. pick up a pencil and occasionally add a name to. Uh, so that when I do get a call from a headhunter, I, I always uh, I always say, well, but let, let me think about, you know, send me the spec and I'll get back to you. So I feel that I'm sort of a, an informal supply chain. Um, <laughs> Excellent. The, uh, the headhunters of, uh, uh, of the UK are actually a few in Europe as well. And, uh, and women I happen to know, uh, but I do find I need to know more younger women because a lot mm. of the ones that I know now are sort of mid-career, uh, sometimes beyond mid-career, uh, and uh, it's important to keep that, you know, to keep the, um, uh, the the labor movement going. The other thing that's really important is when you are in a position to choose who works for you, then it's really important to think about expanding the network to include more women, and that's something that I do very deliberately. Or we used to, I worked at Google for a while and we used to have, uh, we introduced a rule that actually was not my idea, that we would not participate in a panel unless it had some diversity. And gender diversity, obviously an important part of that, although not the only kind. And I noticed the other day, I was chairing a discussion that was a great discussion amongst uh, well, myself and three female economists from academia, Wall Street, and the policy world and Wall Street, uh, Penny Goldberg, Joyce Chang, and Kathy Mann. And they were fantastic in talking about current uh, challenges and questions on economics. And then later that day, I was in another, I was observing and listening to another great discussion about the economy and are we in a bubble and so on. It was all men. There were five panelists who were each had a, a segment. Um, and it was quite unnecessary to have them all be five. Though, by the way, there were five white men. So just don't, don't do that. <laughs> and we need to push the boundaries and probably women need to be the ones in the forefront of that, just as women are in the forefront of research about gender and the importance of gender. I suppose the other thing which I find uh, now that I have more time on my hand and hands that it's actually extremely uh, satisfying to be able to, to mentor or to advise. I, I think mentors may be too strong a word for, for many of the conversations that I have with, uh, with young women, but it's, uh, it, it's gratifying that they want your advice, first of all, it, um, that one hasn't passed beyond the pale in terms of age range, um, but also that there, there are lots of uh, questions that younger women have. And I suppose the piece of advice I find myself giving more often than any other is just to keep your options open as a woman. Uh, true of men too, of course, but you just don't know what the future holds. And quite often something that, um, that, that you may think is, is extraneous, turns out to be very important in, in future work. And I suppose that maybe I feel that way partly because I was very focused when I was in my 20s and maybe even 30s. I, I stuck with things that I knew, that I enjoyed, that I felt I did well. At the beginning of your career is, what do I want? The focus is, what's the discipline? What's the skill set? What's the kind of job? Let me do that job for a while. Now, I, I think you, you, you do, do need that. And I would say to young women, think about that. Well, I think that goes to my point about confidence, because 
in order to diversify, you have to be able to take some risks because the focus tells you, okay, this is the next step. This is a logical next step. Then all of a sudden something comes in. I mean, I, I changed a lot of my academic focus based on an opportunity which came in. It was a government advisory opportunity, believe it or not, coming from, uh, from the state of California. And my academic colleagues said, do not do this. This is not, there's no academic value to this. I said, but this is like really interesting. And maybe economics can really say something to this. I think I'm going to do it. Okay. There are all sorts of risks with doing that. I mean, I won't do a good job. I, I didn't know the topic. I had to learn the topic. My academic colleagues would say, forget it. I give up too much research time. So I end up not with enough Google citations in my research. There's lots of risk. You have to be confident if you to say, I'll take the risk, I'll take the risk. So it's focus plus confidence, plus some ability to take risk. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I guess it's a matter of degree. I think, um, I think I say, be more open to these things, develop other interests, partly because I feel I've been too focused. Yeah, okay. it's been successful. Okay. Uh, but when I, when I speak to mid 20 year olds today, okay. They've, they've got their degrees, they're in their first or maybe second job. Okay. Uh, it's a good job. Uh, mm -hmm. It's consulting or it's, um, you know, something that, that so far they've succeeded, but they're so deadly serious. <laughs> <laughs> they are so focused on the next promotion or, you know, whether they'll be, whether the next assignment will be something that will stretch them in some particular dimension. It just seems a little bit too, um, you know, they're missing out on a lot of, a lot of fun in life uh, if, if you're too focused on these things. And I absolutely agree with you, Laura, that if you've got confidence, it'll take you a long way. And so you need to be confident to, uh, to relax a bit sometimes and, um, you know, let things roll at their own pace. There's a, there's a time for everything. I don't think there's a right or a wrong. What I do think is that it's important for younger women to acknowledge what they feel like and not to feel guilty if they really enjoy being in the office and working and also not to feel guilty in relation to their office if they want to be at home. I think that should get easier or if they want to, you know, make it to a soccer match or soccer game or Oh, whatever. It should get easier as employers uh, are used to, and as younger men push for uh, that kind of diversity. I, I would just add that I think it's really important as you get more confident and more senior to call out bad behavior. And of course, we've had a big reckoning on, on uh, sexual harassment and Me Too, but there can be all sorts of subtle bad behaviors that can be intimidating. And it's incumbent on those of us who have got to a certain point in our careers to just push back if you see that kind of, uh, you know, slighting of women that still occurs. Well, this has been an incredibly interesting and exciting discussion. I hope, you know, whenever we get together and we have these conversations, we realize that there is so much more to talk about. And uh, I'm, you know, even in more of you and, uh, and um, so honored and so excited to be working together and wanted to thank you for taking the time today to talk, but I really hope next year we can do this in person.